Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Nice meeting you all, and welcome to AIGS 21st Forum. I'd like to introduce Dr. Chu Hui, who will introduce uh, today's speaker. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, welcome to this forum. Uh, I think I, will, I better be quiet before. Dr. Wing here, but uh, I was told to introduce him. It is a great honor for me to introduce Dr. Wing Gilman to you. But uh, since he has been here several times, we may not need to introduce him, but we have some new students, right? So I will introduce him to you. He was born in the Netherlands and uh, immigrated into USA at the age of 19. 19. He started uh, with a medical studies that he changed his field and ended up with Old Testament scholar, retired and uh, traveling here and there teaching the Word of God. Right, so here. He has a great time and we will be very uh, blessed with his Presentation, so I hope you enjoy the time and be blessed. So, I'd like to invite Dr. Wengeren. Let me start with a quote and then introduce the topic. In a recent issue of Christianity Today, there's an article on revelation or revolution. In other words, in every country in the world, there are issues that we have to deal with. But how do we deal with these issues? Many times it is through revolution. The author says, after decades of watching revolutionary power dynamics, our friends spoke a valuable truth. Revelation is a stronger force than revolution. Please keep that in mind. Why do I say that? It is that we as Christians have the revelation of God and all too often we do not understand it. We steal something out of God's word. We appropriate it wrongly. And what I'm concerned with is proper appropriation. That we have caution in our responsibility and stewardship of God's revelation. It's very easy to serve in a religious way. But religion is not the same thing as revelation. So please keep in mind, in religion, we think very much in terms of social relationships and the wonderful fellowship that we can create at church. That does not nourish the human soul. It is the confrontation with God, where God is able to address us in Jesus Christ where we are able to learn to listen, to sit back, to dwell, and not be active. Notice. So today's topic is then dealing with Christocentricity and appropriation. What I plan to do is to talk, first of all, about the Trinity. You may think it's kind of strange for an Old Testament professor to believe in the Trinity. Yes, I believe in the Trinity. And I want to talk about the Trinity. And then to begin to understand the prophets, how we understand the prophets. And particularly illustrated by use of Isaiah. And the text we have chosen is Isaiah chapter 12. So follow me on a journey. Incidentally, the article you have received was published then at the end of last year in the Torch Trinity Journal, and I encourage you to read it, to reflect on it, and not just to think about another article, but a way of appropriating the scriptures. So, let's turn then to the next slide. I'm a graduate, as some of your faculty members are, of Westminster Theological Seminary. They have had about 10 years of stormy dis discussions dealing then with the matter of Christ and the Old Testament. 
they are concerned is an appropriate concern because they want to see that Jesus is in the Old Testament. But as an Old Testament scholar, my concern is that all too often we overread the text. And we have to be much more cautious with what we are reading in the text. So at Westminster Theological Seminary then, uh, they want to see that there are foreshadowings of Christ in the Old Testament. I have no problems with that. But often it is the nature of prophecy as to how sharp and focused are those foreshadowings. Many times what we want to say is that the Old Testament clearly predicts Jesus as the Messiah. Oh yes, I will ask, because it is not a clear prediction. Keep in mind that the Old Testament nowhere clearly states that the Messiah is God himself. That is the marvel of the Incarnation. Would you please keep in mind that Christ is God's secret, his mystery. And if you read Christ as being clearly in the Old Testament, we miss the whole point of the Apostle Paul, namely that Christ is the mystery of God, who is hidden and whose nature and fullness we experience in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so some of you will be offended when I don't read immediately a messianic content to the text. Because you often come to the Old Testament looking for some selfish value. What do I mean by that? Well, the Old Testament is there and there must be some value to it. So what is it good for unless it speaks about Jesus? Well, that is a Lutheran attitude, my friends. We have to learn to see that law and gospel coexist. There is gospel in the law. And there is also law in the gospel. There are expectations that God has. So all too often, and I've fought this for about 40 years, people then contrast old and new. What is going to unite our understanding is not so much systematic theology, but rather it is theology proper. And I'll explain it in a couple of minutes. So at Westminster Seminary then, there has been a problem in terms of the relationship of Old and New, the Old Testament and the ancient Near East, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what we have to see is that at Westminster they have then taken a position that is relatively strong in a little booklet called Seeing Christ in All of Scripture. I am all in favor of that. And then the subtitle, Hermeneutics at Westminster Theological Seminary. There is again a reminder of Westminster's historic mission. And that goes back to J. Crash and Nature with a beautiful statement. Glorious is the heritage of the Reformed faith. God grant that it may go forth to new triumphs ever or even in the present setting of unbelief. Wonderful. Then one of my own teachers, Gavin contributes to it, friends of mine, Bill, and uh, let me think a second, do good, that's right, do good, are contributing to it as well, and for Kevin, systematic theology has to be the framework for doing biblical theology. Now, some of us that are in biblical theology, Old or New Testament, and we're not too comfortable with a straitjacket of doing Biblical theology in relationship to systematic theology. So my response in that article was, well, what we need is a good understanding of the Trinity. And the Trinity, listen carefully, is not a systematic theological doctrine. It is a biblical theological doctrine. According to one of the finest systematic theologians. Benjamin Warfield. And I want to introduce us to a couple of points of Warfield. So what is it that Warfield is saying about the Trinity? Incidentally, he wrote this article in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Did you hear it? Bible Encyclopedia. He wrote this for biblical scholars and students reflecting on what the Bible teaches about the Trinity. So here you have a couple of great pictures of Benjamin Warfield. Let me say something personally about him. He and his wife 
were in Germany where he was doing further advanced studies. They were walking out in a forest and she was struck by lightning. She never recovered. Her whole life till the year 1915, her whole life, he had to take care of her. <coughs> he couldn't easily travel, but he wrote extensively while he was taking care of his wife. They never had children, and that is just a personal dimension of these theologians that we hear about, that these theologians are human beings. And so Warfield then wrote about a trinity. Let me cite a couple of elements. First, it would seem clear that we must recognize in the Old Testament doctrine of the relation of God to his revelation by the creative word and spirit. Notice God, word, spirit, at least the germ of the distinctions in the Godhead after what fully made known in the Christian revelation. In other words, the Old Testament has the germ of the trinity. You don't find it clearly. There are intimations. And we are often so impatient. We want things clear. Jesus has to be clear in the Old Testament. The Trinity has to be clear in the New Testament. And we are not willing to see that God is, as it were, lisping to us. Because if God were to speak according to the self-communication of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we would not understand anything. But God comes to us and communicates something of himself gradually and slowly. Another quote from Warfield, The Old Testament may be likened to a chamber, richly furnished but dimly lighted. The introduction of light brings into it nothing which was not in it before, but it brings out into clearer view much of what is in it, but was only dimly or even not at all perceived before. What is Warfield saying here? The Old Testament is a beautiful room. There's not much light, but it is beautiful. And in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, you begin to look at the Old Testament in a fresh way. It's not that the revelation is new, it's there. Jesus is teaching, and incidentally, would you always keep in mind that Jesus does not just teach from the law or the prophets. Again and again he says, haven't you read the law and the prophets? In other words, what we need to do is not just take a verse here or there, but to know the law, to know the prophets, to know the writings, and to begin relating these very much like one point can go anywhere. Two points, you can have a straight line. Another point, you can have a better understanding of the straight line. That's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, if you know Moses, the prophets, and the writings, you'll hear me. And if you don't know Moses, the prophets, and the writings, you really cannot discern the voice of Christ. Now, that is quite an indictment, my friends, because most of us don't know the Old Testament. We play with the Old Testament. We steal from the Old Testament. We take certain verses out of the Old Testament and we say, this blesses my soul. Who cares about something blessing your soul? If I steal something from you, it may bless my soul, but I've stolen something from you. I've robbed you. Are you with me? And that's often what we do with God's word. We rob God's word without really listening to God. So for John Calvin, it was very important to listen not only to the biblical author, but to God. And that is the point that I will be trying to develop this afternoon. So, we have then the Old Testament. He continues, The Old Testament revelation of God is not corrected by the full revelation which follows it, but only perfected, extended, and enlarged. Now, what is he driving at? He's saying this, that when we read the Old Testament, there are anticipations. There must be more of God than what has been revealed. You have then little indications where the prophets are saying that the Spirit must come down to us. That God comes down to us. Think about the very saying of Emmanuel. God is with us. 
So is it enough to know that God is with us when he's seated in heaven and the earth is his footstool? Or are we looking for more imminence of God? And that's what the Old Testament is doing. It's looking for God to be more involved. So, for example, in Isaiah chapter 64, the prophet says, Come down, O Lord, or I would that you come down, O Lord. That's what we have in the Incarnation. God has come down to us, do you see? So look at these intimations in the Old Testament. So in the language then of Warfield, nothing needs to be corrected. You may say, of course it has to be corrected. Because after all, Paul was a monotheist. He believed in one God, the Shema. Here in Israel, the Lord our God is one. How can you then talk about three gods? No, Paul is not talking about three gods. He's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the amazing thing is that Paul, being trained as a monotheist, had no problem accepting the doctrine of the Trinity. Christians, that's what the disciples did with Jesus. <laughs> Think about the most important question in the Old Testament. Michayahu. Who is like Yahweh? Try to answer that one. Are you with me? So, questions are so important. The text is intended to raise questions. And Isaiah's text particularly. So he begins beautifully by saying, In that day you will say. Notice in verse 4. In that day you will say. Pay attention to the language. In verse 1 it is singular. In that day you singular will say. In verse 4, in that day, you plural will say. There's a shift taking place. There's a development. <coughs> Sit with a text. Yes, you may use the Hebrew text. And it might help sometimes. And don't be uh, embarrassed or ashamed by carrying a Hebrew text. <laughs> but rather see that the Hebrew text can elucidate certain things. So, what is happening in between verses 1 and 4? Watch this. Praise. Worship. I will praise you, O Lord. Although you were angry with me, your angry anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Pay attention. Change from anger to comfort. Verse 2. You have the language of salvation. God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord... The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Verse 3. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Do you hear? Salvation, salvation, salvation. So you have comfort. You have salvation. You have a response. I will trust and not be afraid. You have the addition that the Lord is my strength and my song. But Isaiah is using language that you find in Moses. Observe then that Isaiah is intentionally using Mosaic language so that you would say, ah, that sounds like Moses. And now you're connecting Moses and the prophet. And that's what Jesus is driving at. Then, in verse 4, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, proclaim that his name is exalted. What is this doing? It is saying not just worship the Lord, but live in the presence of the Lord. The psalmist recognizes here, or the poet recognizes here, that God is exalted. What do you have in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. One of the main themes in the book of Isaiah is the exaltation of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we have worship, but also wisdom. And now look at the witness that he speaks of. He continues. Saying to the Lord. He has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy people of Zion. Now here you have the gospel. For great is the Holy One of Israel among you. What did Isaiah say in chapter 1 verse 4? O oh, sinful people. Loaded with guilt. You have spurned 
the Holy One of Israel. He was burned. Now, what is Easter all about? Easter is all about Christ having been spurned by people. He was spurned the Holy One of Israel. And what is the Holy One of Israel offering to us? For great is the Holy One of Israel among you to be present with us. That is then the paradox of Easter. The death of Christ and the resurrection. The rejection by people and the acceptance of people. So there is already an intimation in terms of how God is going to be present with us. Great is the Holy One of Israel. <coughs> Among is the other thing that we can say, Christ afflicts the comfortable. So play with that. Christ afflicts the comfortable. Look at the next verse, where we read, then, But woe to you who are rich, for you already have received your comfort. Do you see? So you have two kinds of comfort. One that will be lasting, and the other one is short-lived. So Christ is the agent of comfort. And we in Christ can be agents of comfort. Ah, let's now take a look at that expression. Salvation, my salvation, wells of salvation, drawing water, drawing water, drawing water. What does that remind you of? Let me turn to John chapter 7. At the end of the Feast of Booth, Sukkot, there was a celebration then of Israel's life in the desert. Water was drawn, was poured out, ritually, reminding of the abundance of water that God had provided for his people in the wilderness. Back to the wilderness. Exodus, Red Sea, experience in the wilderness. And observe then as to what happens. Jesus then cried out with a loud voice saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, John says, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not been glorified. What we have here is how Jesus appropriates the text. He is the one who is able then to open the wells of salvation. He is able to give water, that's truly the water of life. <coughs> Magnificent way. So may I make the point again. I don't speak about application. I speak about <laughs> appropriation. Application is very easy. You can see resemblances, you see connections, and they may not be appropriate, but they preach. Appropriation is when you see something and you discover something. It is much more the object of observation, exploration, testing, and the more you test yourself in God's Word, the more you have a sense of this is a good journey to walk on. That is what happens generally in doctoral studies. And many times pastors don't even come close to that. I encourage you, begin your journey while you're here. Listen to your teachers. Ask questions of your teachers. Explore the scriptures. Don't be satisfied. Let me give you a personal testimony that when I was at the age of 20, I think, I came to Moody Bible Institute having tried the pre-med program and thinking that I wanted to become a medical missionary. Okay, Then I thought that was too uh, filled with pride so let me just become a missionary but if I'm going to be a missionary I want to know Greek and Hebrew <laughs> you can see the road I was already thinking about more theological studies so I came to Moody a dispensational school and I began to read more about dispensationalism and I had more and more problems so what did I do? I ordered books from the Netherlands written by reformed theologians Calvin uh, sorry, not Calvin, uh, Bavink and Kuiper, and then it, it led me to Calvin likewise, but all of a sudden the light was there. Would you please 
We have questions. Pursue the questions. Don't do this necessarily as part of your homework. Just because you are improving yourself. You get to know the questions you have and pursue those questions. And then your classes will become much more alive and it will be much more exciting. So appropriation is then where you dwell with issues. I would like to say to young people, do you have a question that you can work on for the rest of your life? Those are the issues that you find in scripture likewise. And so with that then I have uh, one more thing and that is Isaiah 25. What do you find again in that day? You will see, very similar to what we have read in chapter 12. What will the people say? This is our God, we trusted in Him. Same kind of language as in Isaiah chapter 12. And He saved us. Do you see? Again, the language of Isaiah chapter 12. Observe then the relationships between texts. Pay attention to small expressions such as on that day. You will say. And then we have that beautiful expression. We trusted in Him and He saved us. With that then, my song dance has come to an end. <laughs>